Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a very British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal guys. And we do this one topic at a time. We are myself, Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate, and my brother, Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. We generally choose a topic of interest. We spend a very small amount of time researching it, have a discussion in our minds, and then we have a real discussion, and we publish the notes. Those notes are available on our website, eclecticist.co.uk. You can read along as we have our discussion. The main benefit of this is that we hope to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully will prompt further thought and discussion from you, our listeners. Any feedback, please visit our webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. You'll find a form at the bottom. The topic we're tackling this week is Volkswagen, the car manufacturer. Devised during the frenetic interwar years in Germany, Volkswagen, the people's car manufacturer, was envisaged to be an affordable, usably efficient, and family-oriented means of transport that every ordinary German could own and enjoy. Now, nearly an octogenarian, Volkswagen has given us the original hipster camper van ride, the Love Bug, a near continuous succession of grey drab saloon cars, high profile acquisitions, massive expenditure on lobbyists, and a share price sinking scandal. Volkswagen, endearingly generic. Do we still want to lovingly lever off the badge? What we're certainly not going to talk about this time round is Vin Diesel. So, Volkswagen, they're a car manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I see their cars everywhere and all the time. Mm. They seem to be very, very popular indeed. They have that super iconic badge on the front and back. But I've never, ever had any inclination to purchase one of their cars, Mm. nor have I ever found any one of their cars interesting at all for any reason. Am I wrong? Oh, I can't read your mind. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, I have never owned a Volkswagen car, but I have certainly found certain models of their cars attractive to me as a car guy. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Carmen Ghia, um, which is a very iconic looking roadster from the 60s and 70s. It looks like a roast chicken. It does look like a roast chicken, but in a good way. And maybe a couple of other of their cars. Uh, none Sirocco? Mind. No, I never liked, Jetta? never liked the Sirocco. But they're very popular Toran. cars. The Volkswagen Golf, which kind of started off the whole hot hatch trend, you know, I think it was like early 70s that that hit the four courts. And then, you know, it picked up proper momentum in the early 80s when all the other manufacturers started to create their own version of the Volkswagen Golf. They've always been kind of ubiquitous. And I think it's always like a safe car to buy, not safe as in like Volvo safe, you're not going to die. But safe as in, you you know from the name that you're going to buy a highly dependable car that you know you can put a million miles on or whatever, and it won't be a hassle. Stuff won't be breaking all the time. All that kind of good stuff. Which I think was the original intention. Um, this is a manufacturer who was established in the late 30s. 1937, I believe, is when they were properly incorporated as a business. And uh, it all started... Uh, with Hitler's involvement uh, in the interwar years, as I mentioned. And he he wanted, he was the driving force behind the desire for an affordable car, the people's car. And uh, he really had a great interest in the actual design process of the, the cars that he had in mind. And at that time, it was only one car I think he had in mind, which was a very small saloon car for families. And I think this is what became known as the the beetle or the bug it's shape it's called here in the united states or the bug or the pregnant roller skate but at the time hitler even reportedly passed along some sketches of his some ideas that he had for a car and he he passed these along to some of the engineers of volkswagen uh, and also ferdinand Porsche uh, had a copy of uh, his sketches. But apparently, 
and this could be true, Hitler had basically plagiarized the designs of an existing car designer and engineer, uh, Joseph Ganz, who built a car called the May Bug. And uh, it was evidently unveiled at a mid-30s Berlin motor show. And uh, Hitler thought that that was the sort of shape and uh, design that he would like as his people's car. And also the, the extra level of scandal there is that Joseph Ganz was, was a Jew. Indeed. Um, I have a quotation here from josephganz.org. More than 80 years ago, Jewish engineer Joseph Ganz amazed the people of Frankfurt by racing his revolutionary May Bug prototype over the city streets and sidewalks. This lightweight rear-engine car was part of his dream for the German people a Volkswagen that anyone could afford. Two years later, Ganz presented the first German Volkswagen before Chancellor Adolf Hitler at the Berlin Motor Show, but as a Jew, he was quickly arrested by the Gestapo and any connection between him and what soon became Hitler's Volkswagen project was erased from the pages of history. So that's fairly terrible, but... The idea for a family, affordable family car, of course, goes way back, probably, you know, back to Daimler and, and Ford, of course. Um, Ford's Model T was meant to be affordable by families. And uh, um, Mr. Ford even developed the propulsion mechanism, you know, the, the, the fuel he sold the means to produce the fuel for the car as well to try and make it you know affordable without massive infrastructure uh, to get it all up and running so you know i think right at the very start of a lot of car manufacturers certainly in that era it was all about affordability distribution scale of manufacturing and uh, you know you you want your car everywhere to be driven by everyone so that was the original motivator motivator behind the development of the initial cars on the Volkswagen production line. And, um, and from there, they just ballooned and, uh, and created uh, many millions of very similar cars for many decades. They didn't really have that many cars on offer. You know, for the first few decades, really, it was only a couple of models. It's only very recently when they really started branching out with lots of different um, chassis styles. Well, the, the Beetle never really was during Nazi Germany and during the war. I mean, they started to make Beetle-like military vehicles of some description during the Second World War. But it was only after the war that they started actually building them for reals. Yes. And uh, they were very cheap to manufacture. I mean, they were very cheaply made. The original Volkswagen Beetles were uh, pretty terrible and made out of the thinnest possible metal because metal was you know, hard to come by, and everything was rationed. So, you know, they're very simple machines, uh, fairly unreliable. And, of course, they had air-cooled engines, which apparently was Hitler's suggestion. He didn't want your average German to experience uh, a guaranteed radiator burst in, in the middle of winter. Uh, because most Germans wouldn't be able to house the cars. If it's a people's car, it'll spend a lot of time in the street, parked outside the homes. So he wanted them to uh, to be as reliable as the current technology would allow, which was not very reliable at all. Well, they did have antifreeze back in those days, but it was kind of... Um, I think it was expensive, or they wanted to use they wanted to use all the antifreeze that they could manufacture in planes. I think that was the idea. Yes, indeed. And um, as I mentioned earlier, although I think I got his name wrong, Ferdinand Porsche. Oh, what did you say before? I may have said Fernandez Porsche. <laughs> I mean, of course, Ferdinand Porsche. I think he was on a commission. Hispanic and, brother. Uh, he designed. He designed the car. His his alter ego. His weekend name. Uh, so you know, it was designed by a, a very talented uh, designer, and of course, it produced an incredibly iconic shape. You know, it was a really. It wasn't. Super original. I mean, there were other cars at the time that mm. had that sort of beetly yeah, shape. Sab. You know, I think that the two the two windows at the back, or rather one bisected window at the back of the cab, I think was quite common. There are lots of American cars 
that maybe just because it was difficult to to manufacture a single wide pane of glass and it's easier to make two and join them together i don't know but uh, i think uh, it wasn't super de duper original but i think it was original in that it was it was affordable you know it was i think you're thinking of a uh, glass manufacturer in the 16th century well i think um <laughs> stained glass, glass manufacturing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a little bit of leading in the middle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, certainly the original Beatles didn't have a single pane of glass in the back. But they certainly uh, had up front. They had two. They did have on the front, though. Yes, quite right. I don't know whether or not they were laminated, but uh, I assume they Almost weren't. Almost certainly not. But they also were not wraparound. It was just like a sheet. Yes. Um, so total death traps, basically. But luckily they could only do about 45 miles an hour. And there were hardly any other cars on the road. So, mm. But air-cooled... Um, very simplistic, uh, but incredibly popular. Mm. So they were popular throughout, you know, through the war and after the war, and uh, they just picked up momentum. I think uh, after the war, um, they, well, like like all the companies in Germany, uh, they were out of business, effectively. And it was enterprising um, vulture capitalist investors from the West who came over and reinvested and helped get these companies back up and running. And this was certainly true for Volkswagen. I think it was a, a British colonel who um, brought the uh, Volkswagen brand back into full production. Now you see what you did there? I mean, you just kind of totally um, seamlessly took a very uncharitable view of Western or America's uh, motives there. And you call them vultures. Well, no, I mean, what I meant by that, that's a terrible thing to say, and I didn't mean that <laughs> disparagingly, and I retract that statement. What I meant to say is that it was enterprising Westerners who, I mean, it was, it was in the interests of the West, of course, after World War II to help rebuild Germany yes. because they didn't want to fall into the same trap, you know, to leave a power vacuum or to uh, leave broken infrastructure, which would just simply, you know... Um, set the plant the seeds to rearm and re-engage so certainly it was in everybody's interest to properly rebuild their economy and uh, volkswagen was one of the companies that uh, was effectively rebuilt after the war and uh after then uh they just uh started building lots more cars uh increased their the reach of their distribution and honed their product of course now i think they they build in excess of 10 million cars a year, which boggles the mind. 10 million cars. My gosh, that's a huge number. Just Volkswagen you know, or they Germany? They really are stamping these cars out. Who are we talking about here? I, I think that number includes currently all of the cars in the Volkswagen Group. Right. Oh, Audi. So the Volkswagen, and, yeah, the Volkswagen uh, Group. I mean, they have acquired many other companies, um, not just automotive companies but you know they're manufacturing companies but just of the automotive companies that they have purchased include bugatti this is a french manufacturer of very high-end luxury cars a uh, very old company uh, they've purchased lamborghini uh, an italian uh, performance car specialist uh, audi which is a car that is perhaps a class above the standard offerings from Volkswagen themselves. So they're sort of a um, towards a luxury sort of manufacturer of mostly saloon cars, but they have a, a sort of sportier contingent. Uh, Bentley, which is a, a very old mark, as they say. Uh, it used to be a handmade, uh, bespoke British car manufacturer and manufacturer of luxury cars mm. porsche which i believe ferdinand porsche initially set up as a performance car or race car manufacturer and they certainly still are a performance car manufacturer um they're sort of like the sports version of the beetle i think porsches they're just like a, a beetle that's been stepped on a bit um sayat which is a spanish manufacturer and uh, they were purchased and they, they look quite similar to a lot of Volkswagen, isn't it? Skoda. Skoda is some sort of East European manufacturer which was purchased. And then Ducati, 
which is a motorcycle manufacturer, an Italian motorbike company, um, which I didn't know. I didn't know they uh, they owned a Ducati. Mm. That's interesting. So they've made a lot of uh, canny investments and uh, intelligent acquisitions. And now they have about half a million employees in many, many, many countries. And, uh, and they are producing many tens of millions of cars, uh, which is incredible. I mean, a real power business. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's just incredible, their reach. It, it never ceases to blow my mind, these uh, large car manufacturers. And they're number three in the world. <laughs> they're not even the biggest. Mm. And yet they're producing over 10 million cars a year. It's just, just incredible. Yeah, um, Skoda. Yeah, they are a, uh, a company from Czechoslovakia. Um, they were like a real big deal in the Second World War. And I guess, may, I don't know when Volkswagen would have actually bought them. Maybe, it's a good few years ago now. But it's definitely quite a long time after the Second World War that they were acquired. But uh, they kind of did this amazing job with Skoda because Skoda was seen as like the most embarrassing car that anyone could possibly own. They had this unbelievably bad image, Skoda, in the UK at least. Their Skoda jokes were like a thing. Um, and Volkswagen came along and bought them, and it seemed like such a crazy move. I mean, like, you know, what can you do with Skoda when they have that kind of rep um, reputation? But yet they somehow managed it. They had this ad campaign. Well, well, first of all, they made these amazing Skodas. They made these amazing Volkswagens that had Skoda badges on it that were actually genuinely good cars. And they managed to have this amazing marketing campaign, which kind of acknowledged the whole, um, you know, trashed Skoda image and sort of made light out of it. Now, I don't know whether or not you would ever buy a Skoda or someone you know, but it does. it's not what it used to be. Could it be that people are putting less stock in the badge and more faith in the features and the manufacturing. I mean, if it's a reliable, safe car for a reasonable price, I mean, does anybody really care about the badge anymore? I mean, if it's fit for purpose and it ticks your box, the only consideration beyond that would be just purely an aesthetic consideration. Mm. You know, I want this badge. Mm. But the actual car underneath the skin, it seems to make less uh, 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 it matters less it would seem to me because when i look at these sort of upper range volkswagens like the you know fully loaded passats or that bizarre phaeton to me that i i cannot distinguish them from audis you know the audis are similar size similar features similar performance similar price and i think well what's What's the difference? It's almost as if, you know, <laughs> they're sharing components, which is true, you know, in some of the models. For instance, there are Audis that have Lamborghini engines in them. But the Skodas, I, I look at a Skoda, and if you were to remove the badge, there's absolutely no way I would be able to tell what it is. I, I might be able to tell you it's a German car, but beyond that, I couldn't possibly identify the actual make. They're, they're so generic mm. looking. I mean, you'd be so, you'd be sort of wrong by saying it's a German car, but I would because I'm so cynical in this regard. I could say that about every single car; <laughs> they're all the same. Well, particularly all within their group, you know, whatever category of car we have, you know, it's just they're they all look the same to me. They do all look the same. I mean, I think for me, Volkswagen have always been extremely generic. I mean, I, none of their cars have ever done anything for me whatsoever. I, I suppose the Beetle is a little bit different looking from most cars. They've managed to make it look, well, the new one looks kind of, again, a lot like one of the Audi models. Uh, the new, new one kind of looks like a slightly chubbier Audi TT, I believe. Mm, mm. Well, I mean, I, uh, I can see why you I mean, say I can, that. I can almost see, you know, similarities between these cars. I look at a Beetle, I look at a Porsche, I look at an Audi TT. I can kind of see, you know, almost a related design language, as they say. So I, I suppose they must be sort of conscious of this. When I look at Porsche or I look at Lamborghini I see, or Bentley, I certainly see a common design language throughout their model ranges. Um, but... Volkswagen, I tend not to think that so much. I don't think, oh, well, that's definitely a Volkswagen because it looks so similar to... I mean, sure, their cars look kind of similar, but 
I don't see a, a sort of inherited f- phenotypic similarity, if you know what I mean. I, I don't think they actually have a design. I think they had the beetle, and that was it. There was nothing really after that. I suppose that camper van that was quite popular with the hippies in the 60s, uh, I guess. But, that, but then that was a one-off. I, I didn't see a sort of gradual procession or an evolved kind of sequence of models that continued a particular look I think, in Volkswagen. You know what? I think you're totally wrong. I think there are, Volkswagen was a very distinctive, or, or their cars were very distinctive. Um, and they, yeah, but, they but individually, you had the Beetle, you had the camper van. What, where are the transitional species? Uh, well, there's the Carmen Ghia, which is essentially the same underpinnings as a Beetle, but it's just slightly more I do refined. not think they look similar. Carmen Ghia, to me, does not look anything like the Beetle. Okay. It sounds like the Beetle, in that it sounds terrible. It sounds like a, a bunch of rabid armadillos inside a empty bean can no there are other um volkswagen models i mean i kind of disagree with you there i do see a similarity between the beetle and the carmen gear right okay i I simply don't see that that's fine but there and there are other models which um have the same kind of dna involved they have some see hippies also they tend there's this other volkswagen model which name escapes me which is kind of like an estate car or a station wagon that we would say in this country and it had the air-cooled engine and all the rest of it and it was clearly part of the same family, and so and so on it went. It's only in modern in the modern era now that uh, they've all started to look the same. You know, Volkswagen, for obvious reasons, have obviously ditched the whole air cooled format, um, water cooled now, just like every other car, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I just simply re- reject what you've said. Well, you've just said the only example you gave me was that the Carmen Ghia looks like the Beetle. Well, I don't think it does. No, there's a, there another, was another, another example. Oh, okay. Yes, if you want to be pedantic and tedious. There was... A, I'm going to have to look this up. I should just say that the, the manufacturer list, the largest car manufacturers currently, I was surprised. But Toyota is number one, uh, followed by General Motors. They're still up there. I'm amazed. They're currently number two largest manufacturer, followed by uh, Volkswagen, number three position. More than 10 million cars produced in 2014, uh, which is crazy. They were the first manufacturer to partner seriously uh, with the Chinese, this FAW Group Corporation. 1991, they had this massive uh, deal with the Chinese to supply Volkswagens and Audis in China. Amazing. It's a big market, I suppose. So, uh. Okay, so I'm going to send you that, and then I'm going to send you this. Oh, so this is a Volkswagen with uh, droopy eyelids and it's a sort of a wagon yeah but it's, it's clearly part of the same family as the whatever it's called the, the camper van and i see a lot of um carmen gear in there and a lot of beetle in there as well mm. we'll have to put these in the show notes obviously this is, i will it doesn't work that well um, in audio but the name of that is the something or other <laughs> it has, actually has the engine in the back it's an estate with the engine in the back isn't that crazy that can't be right. Is that true? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Surely things go in the back. Yeah. What's what's in the big, huge, massive front on the nose? That's what I was just you thinking. Tell them no, but what person. are these crazy ass vents sort of in the rear flank there? What would they be for? Doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. I don't particularly see any major similarities there, but I'll take your word. Yeah, but for you it. wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> because you'd have to concede something. Well, I honestly, when I, I see strong similarities between i mean perhaps i'm just thinking about more modern cars but i see a lot of strong similarities in the porsche line uh i just don't see those same similarities in volkswagen Uh, i suppose maybe that's because they offer a lot more chassis types for you know different different uses uh but then i looked at the volkswagen the current volkswagen lineup and they don't sell that many cars their range isn't that massive but then I looked at another couple of car manufacturers, and in fact, most car manufacturers don't have a vast range. Toyota, Toyota don't offer that many cars. So maybe it was just my imagination where I thought, you know, car manufacturers had just hundreds of different models. They don't really. They have, you know, they have several, a few platforms upon which, you know, they can configure different features and various 
tweak various parameters to uh, deliver you the car that you would like. Uh, but certainly they have more models than their high-end acquisitions, uh, like Lamborghini and Bugatti, who only just have, you know, you can count the different models that they currently produce them. Two fingers. But, uh, you know, they're after a much larger market, so I suppose you have to cater for different styles. This whole uses. air-cooled thing that Volkswagen and Porsche seem to embrace so much, you know how air-cooled engines actually work? I do not. It's weird. So, basically, the engines that we're all familiar with, like modern engines that have, um, they're cooled with a uh, liquid. They basically, the whole engine is kind of, um, has this sort of network of pipes or tubes. It's called the water jacket, where the, the water will flow over all the hot parts and cool it down. So, obviously, a water cool, an air-cooled engine doesn't have any of this stuff. But what it does have is this bizarre, complicated network of little flaps that when the engine gets to a certain temperature, the flaps then kind of open to allow air to flow over certain parts of the engine. Well, it sounds bizarre, really, but you know, there's apparently a lot of reasons why an air-cooled engine can be a good thing. Why, why wouldn't the, f- the little valves be open all the time? Why would you block air circulating around an engine? Well, it could, because an engine has to get up to temperature for certain reasons. Like Even in a, in a water-cooled engine, you have something called a thermostat, which, which is a little device little valve that opens as soon as the engine reaches a certain temperature to allow the water to then flow to other parts of the engine to keep the engine at, a, at this constant temperature now that it's gotten up to temp reasons why i have no idea but that's just how it works and it's the same principle in air-cooled engines one of the the latest if not the latest volkswagen car the i think it may be pronounced chiron or maybe yeah i'm sure it's chiron it's a bugatti uh, and it's going to be capable of 280 miles an hour, um, mechanically limited to 280 miles an hour, zero to 60 in less than three seconds, like two and a half seconds. It's the successor to the Bugatti Veyron, which I think came out in 2008 or something. Um, and this new car is able to gulp 60,000 liters of air a minute. So it is a, it's a massive vacuum cleaner um, traveling along the road. It has 10 radiators, 10 of them. Uh, but then it's capable of, you know, faster than 300 mile an hour speeds and, you know, more than 1,200 horsepower and all the rest of it. So it's an unbelievable technological test bed uh, for Volkswagen. And I think Volkswagen... They have they have been fairly innovative as far as technology is concerned. You know, they have come out with a, some interesting concepts. But when I think of hybrid cars, I don't think of Volkswagen. I think of Toyota, Honda, um, BMW. I don't really think of Volkswagen. They have one technology called Blue Motion, and that's all. And I don't think that's hybrid. I think it is, it's a collection of technologies which makes their cars more efficient. So it's a combination of aerodynamics. So, you know, it has a low so-called drag coefficient. So it slips through the air more efficiently. Uh, it has a lower rolling resistance on the tires. So I think uh, probably, no doubt, making those tires more expensive. And I think all of their low resistance tires are also run flat tires, which is handy. Uh, they have regenerative braking or recuperative braking. So every time they, every time you put your foot on the brake, I guess it's helping to charge up the battery. But if it's not a hybrid, I don't see what the massive benefit is there. And also they have the start, stop, start technology, whereby you don't idle. You stop at the lights and the engine turns off. And then when the lights go green, the engine starts up again. It doesn't do that, though, if you've got the air conditioning running. It stays running all the time. But, I mean, the fact that you don't think of Volkswagen in, as you know hybrid doesn't spring to mind, I think just speaks more of bad marketing on Volkswagen's part because they do have hybrid cars. Do they? Yes. What, what are they called? Jetta. That's a hybrid? There is such a thing as a Jetta hybrid, yes. Wow! And that's, no, I didn't know that's, that. That's been around for a couple of years, I think. I mean, I've never, I've never seen 
one. I've seen a Jetta. I've never noticed any sort of hybrid marking or or anything that would. And this could be certainly down to marketing. I've never seen. I've never noticed a hybrid Volkswagen on the road, whereas I notice many, many, many other hybrid cars all the time, and with increasing frequency, of course. Maybe they're not available in, in the UK for some weird reason. It's only in the US. I'm not sure, but yes, for sure, there is a uh, Volkswagen hybrid. So I just kind of want to just touch on more Beetle hippie counterculture stuff because um, there's this crazy irony about how the Volkswagen Beetle was adopted as this icon of the hippie culture in America in the 1960s and probably in the UK as well. And also the um, the camper van and all that good stuff, considering its uh, rather shady origins. Okay, I'll bite. Shady oranges? Uh, oranges? Did I say that? And when I, when I said shady oranges, right. I meant, of course, to say shady origins. Okay. Well, we kind of spoke about this. Is it drugs? <laughs> Is it drug dealing? Did people deal drugs out of camper vans? No, we're talking about Hitler's people's car. <laughs> ah, I thought you were talking about the camper van there. Sorry. <laughs> no, but well, Volkswagen, obviously. And actually, we should put this in the show notes or the uh, Nazi era marketing campaign for Volkswagen. It's like there are lots of Volkswagen. It's like the evolution of the actual Volkswagen VW where it actually had swastikas involved in it. In fact, I've seen um, a kind of play on that in modern times when Volkswagen, like like sort of classic Volkswagen cars are obviously popular amongst collectors and things like that. And they will, I've, I've seen those kind of stickers they put on them where it shows the Eagle of the Reich and he's not clutching a swastika. He's, the Eagle is clutching a VW sign. I've seen that. Yeah. There was a, a film which I loved back when I was a child and you might remember this. It's called The Love Bug. Basically, Herbie. A couple of Herbie films that I really liked. But one in particular was a love bug. And maybe there was another one. I'm not sure. Herbie Goes Bananas. No, not Herbie Goes Bananas. Yes, that's uh, Herbie. But that was made quite a while after the original films and was kind of a bit of a poor facsimile of what had happened previously. A bad sequel, basically. Anyway. So, yeah, The Love Bug, for example. I watched that as a kid and thought it was really great. And I watched it... Re- it was the first autonomous car. That's right. They, they, yeah, for anyone they that doesn't... well ahead of the market. For anyone that doesn't know, it was basically... It totally called Knight Rider. It did. <laughs> it was. It was Knight Rider, but in Beetle form. Yeah, but the, the car couldn't actually talk like Kit talks. It just sort of uh, had a sad beep sound. Meep, <laughs> meep. So I loved this film when I was a kid, but I actually watched it sort of in my adulthood and found parts of it quite distressing and disturbing. Well, obviously stuff I didn't really pick up on when I was watched it as a very young child. So Herbie, his owner, Jack Douglas, I can't remember his name, something like that. He went and bought this. This is the, this is the original film you're talking about, the 1968. Yeah, this is the, this is the love bug. So uh, Herbie's owner went and bought some super sleek European sports car and Herbie got jealous. And destroyed it. Well, no. He, and disfigured it. He did disfigure it. So we heard this commotion, and uh, I think his name's Jack Douglas, or Jim Douglas. He kind of ran downstairs, and Herbie was sort of like bashing into his new sports car. He was like, no, Herbie, stop. And then Herbie fleed. And then we later on, we caught up with Herbie, who was kind of driving forlornly around San Francisco, sort of like, you know, side swiping into walls and going up uh, pavements and just kind of you know um kind of really uh what's the word that you describe someone in that condition quite fragile delicate and uh despairing despairing there we are despairing and then he then tried to kill himself herbie was like on the edge of jumping off a bridge yeah he was on the golden gate bridge and um jim who went out looking for her during one of the rare moments where it wasn't being blown up yes or disaster films you mean they blow up yeah okay and uh, he sort of saw Herbie just like teetering like on, on do you call that a fulcrum if you're teetering like a seesaw, what you're yes. on? He's like, Herbie, no! And they went and saved Herbie who's about to you know, jump into the river and all this other stuff. It's, it all worked out well in the end. But did Herbie deserve to be rescued? I mean, it did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, destroy another car i thought he well he didn't destroy the other car but he was um De- deserves what he gets yeah yeah maybe like a path yeah but uh yeah so i thought that that was pretty heavy you know for a kid's film <laughs> it was very odd um it it, it was uh, of course it endeared the whole world to that little car it did and uh, even to this day you see uh volkswagens with the 53 sticker decals all over them mm. and uh 
I wasn't a fan, but uh, I, I was very aware of that film's popularity at the time. Mm. I always wondered why why was the why was the bumper completely unscathed? You know, the the <laughs> when it cut to the scene of the red sports car being damaged, it seemed as though the red sports car had been dented on every part of the every car, every part of its bodywork, including the roof and everything. Have you I seen thought, this how recently? Did, how then did Herbie, how did Herbie get up there? No, this is I'm purely recollecting this. <laughs> <laughs> from 30 years ago i can't remember that detail uh and i thought well that's weird how did he do that he must have uh that's kind of cool. well it's one of those things that if you think about it it kind of takes a lot of the magic away clearly it's a situation where they had 50 herbies <laughs> and uh, all the, the stunts that they did totally destroyed that herbie like uh dukes of hazard or a car jumps in the air and then lands whoa god man that was one hell of a jump okay Bo, let's go and chase that bad guy or escape from Boss Hog or whatever. It's like, you know that that car was totally destroyed. Yeah. And I think that's the same with all the Herbie films. They probably um, slayed I don't know, a whole day's worth of manufacture of uh, Volkswagen Beetles in that film. They lost their lives. But it was certainly worth it for them because, uh, you know, if you can get your product into a cult film or into the media in, in, in a viral way, then, uh, you know can write your own check and this has happened of course to many cars uh and it, it's helped massively including the the general lee that was a huge boon to sales yeah of course the biggest example of this is the delorean, DeLorean. that yeah, totally absolutely. that film saved the company i mean they wouldn't be manufacturing cars today <laughs> if it weren't for that film no but what it did do was it um it made that car uh, immortal now. And plus, the people who watched uh, Back to the Future as, as a child, they're now old enough to buy DeLoreans. And sure enough, he saw this huge spike in DeLorean sales and interest in um, you know, just popularity and all this other stuff. I'm sure something similar must have happened to um, the Herbie films. But then again, I think a, a Volkswagen is much easier to acquire. Yeah, I certainly regularly see original you know, 60s and 70s Volkswagens on the road. Uh, that have been lovingly restored hmm. or maintained. It's because they're easy uh, to maintain. A, yeah, I see. I see two uh, commonly. Right. That's the camper van uh, and the the bug. Hmm. I see those often. Uh, I occasionally see other older models, and mostly the Carmen Ghia. I don't see any other Volkswagen older models except for early '80s hot hatches, uh, which were very popular at the time and you know, still very popular. So basically, quite a lot. <laughs> well, no, I see early 80s. You basically hot listed hatches, a lot of Volkswagen's. cars there. Well, no, I listed three. There's the camper van and there's the the bug. I see those commonly, I would say, you know, restored on motorways and whatnot. I very occasionally, very occasionally see a Carmen Ghia, you know, rarely, but I do see them. Uh, and, you know, the early 80s Golf GTIs, whatever they were. But that's all. I don't see any of the other models from any other era ever. Or at least I don't notice them. You don't them. notice them. Perhaps they're, yeah. perhaps they're pottering about. But uh, those are certainly the ones I notice. And, uh, and of course, they're iconic. I mean, the badge, the VW badge is iconic. Yeah. Again, the media help there with the Beastie Boys. Uh, wrenching them off the, uh, the lids of vol- hapless parked Volkswagens. Yeah, but th- that seemed like a disaster for Volkswagen. It's, there was a time when, to me as a child, I would think, why would anyone buy a Volkswagen? You're basically asking for your car to be vandalized. But just going back to the ubiquity of Volkswagen Beetles and stuff, I think the reason why there's so many of them on the road, it's because for people who like to tinker, it's the perfect car. It's the perfect first car for someone who likes to fix things because the the rudimentary mechanics. And you mentioned earlier in this talk about being unreliable or not very well made or, or whatever you said. But I, but I think because they're so cheap and easy to fix, that, that kind of doesn't matter. It's like a, there's a problem, you can just whip out your pen knife and uh, whittle up a new part. Which is no longer true, of course, because on a new Volkswagen Beetle, if you wanted to change a light bulb or, God forbid, change the oil, then I'm afraid you're going to have to take it to a, a first-party uh, garage. If you need to change the light bulb, you have to have the whole car resprayed. Yeah, mm. basically. Uh, but that is that is the way of all modern that cars. That is all cars. Which should bring us on to this new chapter in um, Volkswagen's life, which is... Well, before we, before, we, before we get to what I know you, <laughs> you're going to start talking about, just a point on uh, 
the technology, the other techno- technology that is current with the models that I, I spotted, which I thought was quite interesting. I mean, they, they don't have a full-on autonomous car project that has been unveiled to the public yet, it would seem. But they do have interesting things like they have adaptive cruise control, which I think is awesome. I think most manufacturers have that now, but they've had it for quite a while, and uh, I think that's fantastic. You know, you can sort of... It just means that it drives by... No, no, hang on a minute. It doesn't mean it can drive by itself, but it does mean that you're not going to ram the car in front of you. So it incorporates the sort of automatic braking uh, to cruise control. So it's sort of an intelligent cruise control, uh, which is great. And it also has a thing called side scan. Now, I don't know what that technology actually is, but effectively the car is able to sense other cars that are not necessarily directly in front of it. Whether it's using some sort of radar or some sort of uh, sonic proximity detectors, I'm not sure. I don't think it is radar, but I think that's an amazing advance as well. I mean, I love all of these technologies, you know, the, the, the having more sensors on your car, being able to see more and being more aware of what is around you uh, is, you know, a no-brainer avenue to take when you're developing new features in cars, given how dangerous cars are. I think it's really important to take these new technologies seriously and incorporate them where you can. And I think Volkswagen is definitely making a good effort in that department. And of course, there's the TDI engine. So often you'll see Volkswagens with TDI on the back label next to the name. And uh, that was a big innovation by um, the company. And this is a, a turbocharged direct injection system for diesel engines so they've done a lot of work with diesel engines and they they like diesel engines Mm. they're one of the biggest manufacturers who have have the most cars Mm. with uh, diesel engines they just love clouds of black smoke they really do they they really like it they like the the sort of uh they like all of their cars to sound like uh buses a bag of nails yeah uh just like the original beetle um which i don't know if it was diesel was the original beetle diesel diesel. don't i assume it wasn't no but well the the beetle wasn't but the camper van was so they, they, the TDI um, is very reliable, uh, which most diesels generally are, and uh, very fuel efficient. Hey, I didn't get and that memo. Fact, from, their, I, from, their, from their new website, oh, it back says... back up a bit. What's this thing? Most diesels are genu- generally reliable? No, because the, the process of how diesel engines actually work, you, you, know, you need to build them to a higher grade of quality. Right. They need to be more robust because of what they're doing. Okay. Um, And from their website, this quotation, our turbocharged direct injection TDI diesel engines are responsive and fun to drive, as well as being very efficient. They offer more power with great fuel economy, which all helps to lower emissions. That's from their current website. Um, Very popular diesel engines. Also, um, I was looking for hybrid cars and electric cars on their website and their current European lineup, but I couldn't really find anything. There is the Volkswagen XL1, and this is touted as being the world's most fuel-efficient car. It's only a prototype, however, but they really seem to be pushing it on their website as if you can buy it, but I don't think you actually can. Uh, But I think uh, no doubt they will incorporate all of that R&D technology into their current lineup, and no doubt we're going to see something... uh, Something that's going to come to fruition. It may even be the car called the E-Bugster. It's seriously called an E-Bugster. It is a Beetle, and it's an electric Beetle. And furthermore, it has an 85 kilowatt hour battery. So it's right up there with the Teslas. Uh, Zero to 60 in 10 seconds, which is, you know, pretty good for what I could imagine would be quite a low price uh, fully electric car. Um... And it also has an astounding 110-mile range. 110 miles being not that much at all, really. So I'm not quite sure what that's about. This is another prototype, um, but you never know. It, it could come to market, but I wouldn't imagine it would do very well with that sort of range. The range anxiety. I mean, anything less than 200 miles is you know, no-go territory these days for a serious investment in a, in a clean, a so-called cleaner uh, car. Jeff, before you read the next part, I was just um, looking at the the Jetta hybrid on, on Wikipedia. 
And it does say something like, due to hybrid popularity in North America. Oh, da, 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 da. Due to hybrid popularity in North America. So I think it might be a North American thing that there are just yeah, right. more, more hybrids, perhaps. But the Jetta Turbo Hybrid was unveiled in January 2012. I'm pretty sure it, it's a thing. Hmm. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there's a Golf as well, the Garf, Golf R400. Uh, it's pretty retro-looking car, but apparently, again, it's a prototype. Zero to 60 in less than four seconds. Uh, wow, less than four seconds in a Golf. That's like everybody's, every kid's dream uh, in the 80s. Hang on, Jeff, I would just like to say, yes, it's been confirmed. It's just in North America. Aha! <laughs> Breaking news. The Jetta hybrid is only in North America. Okay, I've never never seen one here in the UK, so that would probably explain that. So the, the diesel engines, they're quite serious about diesel engines, which uh, leads us effortlessly <laughs> to the next topic, which is, of course... It has infamously become known as Dieselgate. Right. What do you know about Dieselgate? Well, Dieselgate is fascinating. So I, d- I did a little bit of research into this because I just assumed that this was just like top spin on a story which wasn't really that earth shattering. But it is fairly earth shattering because it is actual deception. This major car manufacturer actually building in deception into their cars cars these days as we all know like a stealth mode you mean is this like a james bondian <laughs> kind of feature i well you know in a way but in a very nefarious kind of way as we all know cars are now packed full of these computers and um some of these computers like hal can no that's a bad analogy here in north america and also probably in the rest of the world i'm not sure what the rest of the world is like when it comes to emissions but here in Actually, here in California, it's particularly strict with emissions. And um, cars have to undergo rigorous emissions standards. They kind of built into this car a situation whereby when the Volkswagen is being tested for emissions uh, compliability, what's the word? Compliance. Compliance. When the Volkswagen is tested for emissions compliance, unbeknownst to the tester, the car goes into pass test mode <laughs> where, <laughs> where it'll kind of nobble um, the, the amount of gases that it's kicking out of its exhaust pipe in order to pass the test. And as soon as its car is back on the road, then it's back into normal p- polluting mode. And it's something to do with the NOx gases. Um, you need a certain amount of unburnt fuel uh, to neutralize these gases. But Volkswagen wanted to retain their really good fuel mileage and so they didn't. They don't want too much unburnt fuel going into the exhaust pipes. They want to save the unburnt fuel so you have better gas mileage. And and so, it's a very deliberate piece of dishonesty and fraud. And who knows what the implications will be? I mean, we're obviously not there yet. But you know, we're talking litigation. People will be suing Volkswagen perhaps because their cars don't have the value they thought they did because no one wants a car like that, et cetera, et cetera. And plus, it's bad news because. You know, there's a reason why we don't want poison to come out of exhaust pipes. And so these cars are kicking out God knows how many times the accepted pollution levels are. So it's bad from every angle, really. It is. I mean, it's not the first time there's been a sort of uh, a scandal of this scale involving a company of this scale. But uh, this was particularly um, sinister, what, I thought. Because what others? Not only, not only, it's not just a single model that's affected. It's multiple models, multiple engines across multiple companies. Mm. So the amount of collaboration, <laughs> to pick a pertinent word perhaps, uh, must have been incredible. I mean, you know, to keep all of this secret, if they do. Hang on a minute. Hey, there's a better word. It's not collaboration. This is actual conspiracy. Yes. Because they it, conspired. Well, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, they did. They conspired and they collaborated. Uh, so what's, um, hang, what's the difference between those two words using it in that way? Well, like a conspiracy is when you get together and you plan something nefarious to someone. Yeah. A collaboration is where a lot of people potentially from different areas get together to work on a common right. goal. So because they have so many companies, they had to get these companies together, which may be working in isolation to a significant degree, but actually pull them into meeting rooms to, to sort of say, look, this is, this is our goal here and this is what we're going to have to do. Go to your various departments and distribute this information. So there's a quotation from Statista site. As of September the 30th, 2015, 
it was confirmed that some 5 million Volkswagen-branded cars, 2.1 million Audi vehicles, 1.2 million Skoda automobiles, and 700,000 Seat cars, as well as 1.8 million Volkswagen commercial vehicles, were fitted with a defeat device in their engines and were thus affected by the Volkswagen diesel deception scandal. And that's an enormous number of vehicles and, a, you know, a few of their subsidiary companies. And the, the, <laughs> the idea was, as you say, to, to go into a specific mode in order to pass an emissions test. Now, the, it begs the question... How did the cars know that an emissions test was being conducted? How did they know this? Well, as you said, these cars are all stuffed full of computers. So this is very intelligent software. Obviously, the manufacturer knows what the, the parameters of the emissions test is. They know how it is conducted and what they're looking for. So they built software to detect that a test is occurring and then switch into a let's not push out too many toxins <laughs> mode. Um, and, and there we have it. That's it. And the very idea, first of all, that they even did this blows my mind, but that they thought they could get away with it <laughs> worries me even more because it really could be a situation where they can say to various governments, look, we employ half a million people. Um, you're jeopardizing a massive section of the economy. We are too big to fail. You need to either not even bring this up or, or drop it like a hot brick. So, I mean, yes, the CEO stood down with, you know, who knows, maybe a golden yeah, handshake and yeah. parachute. And, and there doesn't appear to be too much sincere contrition from the other top level executives. I mean, certainly not from what I've seen in various YouTube videos and uh, radio interviews, it seems like, you know, they're basically saying, yeah, you caught us. And, uh, you know, we thought we could get away with it, but we didn't anyway. I just think they're still unpacking this. I think the whole enormity of this still hasn't kind of hit everyone's heads. I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. I mean, I really think jail time needs to happen. Yes, exactly. They need to be massively punished because... Because of the, the enormity of the effect on the market. I mean, it, you're, you're not a, you're, if we can't believe you, if you're, if you're actively and deliberately deceiving the consumer, well, then why should you be trusted on any other score? Mm. It's just, you know, we, you've lost all credibility, surely. And yes, their share price has taken a tumble. But unless, unless you know, there's court action and real proper massive investigation and maybe slicing up the company and you know just just distributing the uh, or scaling it down something serious and and uh impactful must happen because if they get away with it well then you know what kind of message does that broadcast to the rest of the well, oj simpson community? managed it i mean well this is the thing it's um it's nothing that anyone can claim is accidental it's not just like negligence or incompetence or anything like that. You know, this is actual deception. Actual deception. Actually, actually caught with their hands in the till, <laughs> you know, on, on camera. Yeah. There's no way they can, you know, contort their way out of this. It happened. And they can't, and it's not a case of just saying, oh, well, it was this, this, and this executive. We'll just get rid of them. You know, that's it. Job done. We're, we're back on the forecourt. Uh, no. This, this is what I said about... Um, them, you know, the the soon to ensue litigation, because surely from every camp. I mean, I haven't looked into this in great detail, but just by pumping out all that poison, you know, the in this country we've got something called the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, who are you know they're the ones that make the big noise about cars and their um, emissions, and they're the ones that stipulate the the, the terms. And it's like, holy crap, you know, how long have these cars been kicking out all this pollution into the environment? So that's a whole avenue of pain that they're going to be um, enjoying. And, and evidently, it's many multiples of uh, the acceptable level of toxins really? coming out of these cars. And it's not just they're slightly over the line. No, no, no. They're up to 40 times 
more than the <laughs> acceptable level of emissions. So you know you, you see a you see a Volkswagen going into the emissions test center, and uh, and then you see it driving out with massive black plumes of smoke coming out, <laughs> but it has a pass sticker on the windshield. I mean, someone somewhere is laughing, uh, but it's no joke. And it's not just whether or not the level of emissions out of the car is realistically damaging to the environment or people. It is it is the deception. That is the point. It is the intention. They intended to deceive, and that is where the hammer has to fall. No, but it is it is important about the pollutants because pollution kills... Oh, yeah. Uh, no, yes. pl- pollution kills people. So, so their deception, you know, th- I'm sure they could probably magic some statistics saying that, well, thanks to their increase in these deadly gases, there's been X amount more deaths per year because there is some number about the amount of people who actually die of pollution-based illness, you know, in the United States every year or whatever. Yeah, but they could they bring out counterclaims to say, you know, this increased amount of pollution along the roads prevented people coming out of their houses because they had <laughs> coughing fits, and therefore they didn't die on the road by crossing it to get to the supermarket. Therefore, yeah, yeah exactly. They didn't die by a drone crashing into their yeah, face. Lots of uh, backflippery when it comes to statistics. Yeah. I mean, I've even... Uh, I've even as we were discussing earlier before the show, uh, I was listening to a, a man from Greenpeace who was saying that uh, it's a good thing we're increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere because we're recarbonating the atmosphere and uh, we're decreasing the probability of another ice age. Are you sure he's not a conservative shill? Uh, yeah, I'm positive. But uh, it, it, he makes a good point, and there we are. You know, there's not necessarily anything. I mean, carbon dioxide feeds the plants, so you know, it's not, and it's not, it's not poison, right? I mean, it isn't in and of itself a toxin, right? It's like anything else. If there's too much of it, it becomes toxic. But carbon dioxide is essential for life on this planet. It is absolutely essential. So it's not, it's not like carbon monoxide. Or, you know, metal, heavy metal pollutants coming out of the exhaust pipe. Your Greenpeace pal, he essentially makes the exact same argument that all the climate change deniers in this country make when talking about this kind of thing. Well, I think uh, to get a fair and balanced view, we should probably speak to one of the executives at Volkswagen. I'm sure <laughs> will give us the, the straight truth. But they should be punished, I think, and uh, it's a very unfortunate thing. And I'm sure the vast majority of engineers at Volkswagen probably feel deeply ashamed about this. You know, even yeah. having nothing to do with it, they think, "Wow, you know, what kind of company am I working for?" That's mm. that's as bad as the Nazi Germany. Yeah, that's right. I agree. Well, no, I wasn't quite <laughs> going to go there, but there's another company, and unfortunately, it slipped my mind which one. But there was a company that ran calculations to w- work out what the threshold of deaths may be in order to recall cars with a known defect. Oh, yeah, I heard about so that. So they knew there was a defect. They knew it would cost X number of lives. But they took into consideration how much it would cost to do a recall versus how much it would cost to settle out of court yeah, that's with right. the grieving families. And, uh, you know, these are all economic algorithmic considerations. I think that might have been Toyota. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. I think it was an American car company. That yeah, I think that. it was an American car company, probably yeah. Ford. yeah. I think it They're the ones who used to go to the junkyards and find out what components didn't wear out and then make sure they do. Which which sounds a lot like slander, so I'll say allegedly there. Well, it, it sounds a lot like um, a hypocritical anecdote. But what they what they what they used to do, and they they still do. But I just recently on YouTube watched a um, training video or some marketing video or something of uh, Ford. Or was it General Motors? One of the big three. And how the kind of rigorous tests that they put their cars through, you know, before, you know, when they're in the prototype stage. And so you've seen this undoubtedly with 50 million other manufacturers where they have a robot which will open the door and then close the door, open the close and do that for like a week. And it's yeah. supposed to simulate like, you know, like 10 years of, of use and all this kind of stuff. But just as, a, as an aside, before I get to my main point on that, I also think that's flawed when they show that, when they show like a bum sitting on a seat, you know, like. A machine that's simulating a bum sitting on a seat, sort of like 50,000 times. Ikea style. Yeah, but what they're not taking into account is just how materials break down through age. So like saying, uh, look how this lasted. We simulated like 30 years of uh, constant use and look, it's still perfect condition. But yeah, in 10 years time, it'll fall apart because that's the nature of some of these materials, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Always these tests are, are very, they're finite 
element analyses, as they call them. So they only take into consideration a few of the available variables. But the, the, the point I was, I was going to make was we had this sort of engineer there talking about, you know, this is meant to simulate X. And then he said something like, and, you know, it, if we find that a part breaks, then, you know, sometimes it'll, that part will then be redesigned. And then he said, and, and if a part doesn't break, and then, and then he kind of hesitated, then he said, and then we know we've got, you know, a good design there. And it sounded like our part doesn't break. <laughs> we <laughs> want to make, make sure it a it bit does. crappy so it does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, these are businesses and um, it's a difficult business they're in. You know, they really do have to consider, or you'd, you'd like to think that they have to consider. Um, and this isn't just through regulation. It's also from the need to continue to sell their products. They have to consider health and safety and, you know, uh, the effect on the environment and how they break down and wear out and all of these things. And, you know, you very often see in the marketing and advertising, which is something we haven't spoken about very much, but we see cars in, in refrigerators. We see cars in the middle of a desert, you know, and they, they're trying to tell you that, look, we've, we've tested this car to the very extremes that you'll, you know, far more extreme than you'll ever experience in your day to day commute to your office. Um, so you can believe us that, uh, this is a very reliable product. And uh, I've always thought that car manufacturers have far more pressure on them, exerted on them from governments in terms of, you know, research and development and safety, because they are metal boxes with humans in them that travel very quickly. Uh, the potential for disaster is always there and often realized. Uh, so, you know, if if the microscope is focused clearly on any manufacturing sector i would imagine it is the automotive sector and yet they have the goal to think they can get away with scandals as momentous as this one and that makes me think well maybe the reason why they're so cocky is because they spend so much money on lobbyists and, and lobbying governments i mean certainly uh volkswagen spend almost the most on lobbyists uh for for lots of reasons and to lots of governments and they have a lot of power. Of course, they can easily go to any, you know, and certainly in the UK, if a car manufacturer went up to any MP, they would need only say, how would you like 10,000 jobs in your constituency? And the MP would say, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. What would you like? <laughs> and the, the car manufacturer can basically say, you know, well, I want you to destroy this company, destroy this company, destroy this company, make us a monopoly, you know, help us as much as because because that's you know they have a they have a a responsibility to their shareholders in order to make sure they get a return on their investment. So you know, it's all about they'll do whatever they can to win. We've had this discussion with sport, you know, in competitive sport, they'll do whatever they can to to win, and if it means cheating. Well, if they think they can get away with it. So it worries me. You know, too big to fail worries me. Hmm. But what about God? I mean, they know God's watching them, right? Yeah, but God's not going to get them until the afterlife. Oh, that's true. So they can do what they want here. Hmm. But uh, yeah, in, in terms of advertising and marketing, I mean, there are always Volkswagen ads on telly and, you know, billboards and whatnot. Usually, from my from what I recollect, which is not much, but I, the ads that I see is usually that they're very reasonably priced, and that the price. I mean, there was a big ad campaign where people were, were just dumbfounded at how ridiculously affordable the Volkswagens are, where they're walking into um, building scaffolding or uh, you know s spilling their dinner down their front, uh, just a, a gape at just how unbelievably cheap a Volkswagen is. So there's been an emphasis on how affordable Volkswagens are. I think there was an emphasis on how reliable Volkswagens are. I mean, I'm sure this can be said of any manufacturer, but particularly it's family-oriented van products. It's um, affordability. I don't see so much focused on performance. I, mean, I don't even know what their performance lineup is at the moment. Is it the mm. Sirocco still? Surely that's there are mothballed. There is some... Volkswagen, some sporty Volkswagen, which is super fast, which uh, I saw a little Motor Week little excerpt on. So it's brand new Volkswagen. I think it was, it's actual brand, say brand new, it's before the scandal broke, but it's like ludicrously fast. Some limited edition sporty one. But while we're on the subject of marketing and um, advertising campaigns and stuff, Image 
is somewhat damaged and not just Volkswagen. So Volkswagen had been seen as reliable, you know, all the things that you just said, uh, very solid, dependable cars and all the rest of it. So this scandal has obviously um, harmed their scrupulous image. I say scrupulous, but let's not forget their shady origins, the shady oranges. But not only Volkswagen. Apparently, this is uh, going to... Uh, the, the, the commentators seem to think that this will also have a knock-on effect on just the German car industry in general. I so, wonder who paid them to say that. Toyota. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, Mercedes, BMW, and all the rest of it. Um, and Porsche. And uh, who else are the big German ones? Maybe that's well, it. Pr- presumably, there'll be more um, scrupulous... Uh, investigation and assessment of the other models and other manufacturers. I think the industry as a whole, the regulatory bodies will probably, as take, to take a, an American phrase, double down. Double down. On, uh, Triple on assessments down? Quadrupling down. No, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure probably out of this will become better than ever cars. But there's now going to be this unshakable image problem with German cars now. Average man in the street won't think of them as being super solid, very high quality, indestructible cars made by nazis they're going to think of them as um i don't know there's something else something well i think we, we should watch and uh see what happens uh it'll be very interesting uh, i can't imagine volkswagen will just hemorrhage over this too much or dis- disintegrate entirely i doubt it it's going to completely disappear but i think certainly there should be fairly severe action and if the eu federalistic regulatory state uh, doesn't do a lot, then I think there's there's a major problem there. And uh, you have to immediately start thinking about corruption in politics and the revolving door. So unless there's anything else we think we've missed, um, I'd just like to remind you that you've been listening to Eclecticist. We have a website, uh, eclecticist.co.uk, where you can find all of our previous shows, information on our forthcoming shows, and all of the notes for the shows. Uh, we try to keep those up to date. I mean, if we have any major revelations or things that we've forgotten in a previous show, we'll try and add it in. Our next show could well be Carl Howman, or not. We haven't yet decided. Our outro music of choice this time is, again, something that is royalty-free or out of copyright or open source or otherwise something we won't get sued for. And it is Meteoric Ice Pie Menace by Nick Didkovsky. It is available on an attribution, non-commercial, non-derivatives, uh, sharing international Creative Commons license. And it is very contemporary classical. It is very Michael Nyman. I really like it. It's quite clockworky, and it just and I just thought that's car manufacturing. I just saw Charlie Chaplin getting uh, enmeshed in the gears there when I was listening to it. And I think it's really good. So give it a listen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. We will speak to you next time. Thank you very much, and good evening.